We're going to continue going through the book of Romans, and we're still in chapter (laughs) 1. But we're not going to, uh, we're not going to be able to hit everything uh, in detail, but like in Romans 1, we're going to just go through some of the things that are, uh, the points that I most want us to deal with. If you look in verse 17 of chapter 1, it says, you know, well, let's go to 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, which takes in the whole world. He says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, As it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And we went through the three different possibilities of what he means by the righteousness of God. But just by way of summary, I want to focus in on one of them. And that is, you know, the great question that has always been in the Bible among thinking persons is understanding the holiness of God and understanding our lack of holiness the righteousness of God and our lack of righteousness, the great question is, how can an unrighteous man be reconciled to a righteous God? And so we understand that it is through the gospel. It's Christ living the perfect life we could not live and then dying under the penalties of the broken covenant of works. We broke the covenant of works. He died under those penalties. Suffering the wrath of God, he then died. And so we can be righteous before God, not through our church, not through baptism, not through some ordinance, um, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's an amazing thing. And just so you know, if I can convince you... Well, let me give you an example of what some religions do. Your baby must be baptized in our church. Your ba- you must be married in our church. When you die, somebody from our church must be there to give you the last rites. If you're in a church like that, guess what? They can control you. Do you see that? You need them. You, you have to have them, okay? Okay? Their ecclesiastical institution. You have to have them. And they have control. But in Christianity, you see, my church can't save you. I can't save you. We can't even save ourselves. And if you never walk through the doors of our church, you still can be saved because salvation is not in our church or some right that our church might administer or some authority in the minister. Salvation is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. Now, a a believer and a church can seek to preach the Scriptures. A believer can come up to you and even say, I disagree with you on some things. But ultimately, the only one who has authority to either allow you into the kingdom or to deny you entrance into the kingdom is Christ Himself. And that entrance is through faith in what He did for you. And, and a lack of entrance comes from a, your refusal to accept what God has done on your behalf. Now, church is very important, but your salvation is not in the church. It is in Jesus Christ. And the ministers in a good church need grace and salvation just as much as you do. You see? So that's why we we call no one father in a sense of being an ultimate spiritual authority. We don't call anyone teacher. Even though I'm a Bible teacher and the Bible talks about having teachers, it's not teacher as an ultimate authority. Even the confessions that we have like what do we believe, they are called subordinate standards. They are standards of our faith, but they're subordinate. Subordinate to what? Subordinate to the Scriptures. They're not the end rule of all. It's only the Scriptures. And that's why in a healthy church, in healthy Christianity, you're always going to be called upon to study the Scriptures for yourself. The open to being taught by others, but always very discerning, knowing that even even the man 
who has the most sensitive conscience, is most sincere, and studies the Bible day and night, he's still a fallible man. Do you see that? That doesn't mean you need to mistrust or refuse to trust someone, but it means that give to men and to women only what is due them. They can be sincere, but they'll always be fallible. Only the Word of God is the standard. Everything else is subordinate to it. Now, so he says that how can a man be made righteous? The righteousness of God is revealed. Revealed is a word, um, especially when you look at the, the book Revelation. It's, it's actually in Greek, apokalypsis or apokalypsis. But it comes from a verb running, basically means run the curtain. So if I have a curtain right here and I'm standing behind it, you can't see me. But if I'm to be revealed, someone pulls a cord and the curtain is run and what was behind the curtain is now revealed. So what is revealed in the Gospel? The righteousness of God, His faithfulness, and how can a man be made righteous before God? It's revealed in the Gospel through faith in Jesus. Now we get to 18. It's going to talk about another revelation that is completely the opposite. The salvation of God is revealed in the Gospel. But verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 3 that, that there is a real sense in that everyone outside of Christ, the wrath of God abides upon them. Now, it's not the full sense of the wrath of God. It is varying degrees of the wrath of God. But, but all men outside of Christ are in a contrary relationship with God in which there is a real sense they are under judgment and the wrath of God is against them. Now, I want you to see something about that. You know, for God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the wrath of God is upon everyone who doesn't, doesn't believe. Now, how do we put these two things together? God is righteous. He really is righteous. And let's say it another way. God is holy. Let's say it another way, which is the most unusual way for some of you. You won't get this at first. God is love. Now, in the Bible, love is something that's righteous. It's not unrighteous. God loves all that is righteous, all that is life, all that is good, all that is beneficial. God loves. But you have to understand something. God hates evil. He hates it. Now you say, well, I don't like that. Well, let me ask you a question. If you walked up to somebody and you said this, you said to them, what do you think about what do you think about African what do you think about African slavery? The slavery that happened in Europe and the United States. What do you think about it? And they said, "Oh, I don't know, you know, I'm kind of neutral. I don't, you know, it's not good or bad. It just depends on, you know, what what would you think about that person? Would you think that they were a good person? No, you'd be like, "Man, dude, this is this is horrible. This is immoral." Okay? What would you think about someone, you walked up to them and said, what, what do you think about the Holocaust in Nazi Germany? And they said, well, you know, I mean, things happen. And that was their decision. They believed it was right. And who am I to judge? What would you think about that person? Man, this person is, is not just neutral. This person's evil. Well, let me ask you a question. So if there is an atrocity, a moral atrocity that happens, and you think that it demands that we be angry, but you're going to tell me that there can be moral atrocity, there can be evil, and God doesn't have a right to be angry? If you're angry when some little child is that you read about in the newspaper that's been in prison four years in somebody's basement and has been abused every day and the child escapes only to die in the street of starvation. When you read that, how do you feel? 
You're angry, aren't you? I hope you are. If you're not, you got some serious problems. You're angry. It's a righteous anger. Well, if you and I who are sinners can get angry over things like that, how angry do you think God is? Because He really is love. Also, He really made that child. He really made that African. He really made that Jew. It's His. They're His. He made them. He loves them. It's angry. And He wouldn't be a good God if He didn't get angry. Well, He gets angry. But here's the thing. He doesn't just get mad at Hitler. There's just not an anger about Hitler. You and I have lied. We've committed idolatry, immoralities. But here's what you need to see. God is angry. God is demonstrating His wrath, and yet at the same time, His love is of such a nature that while His righteousness is manifesting wrath, His love is extending a hand. You could say this, with one hand, God's mercy is holding back His wrath so as not to destroy. And with the other hand, God's love is saying, come, come, come quickly, come to Christ. But then at the same time, one day, God's going to pull back His offer. That's what the book of Revelation is about. And He's going to pull back His hand that restrains His wrath. And judgment will finally come. So there is a real sense in which God's wrath is revealed on this world. I don't know if you've ever, any of you have ever seen the play Waiting for Godot. If you had to take a theater class, you probably read about it. But it's, it's kind of like just these guys sitting on this old park bench. It's a dead tree behind them and everything's just gray. Everything is just... There's nothing. Do you realize that's the way the world should be? If you ever... You know, when something bad happens, someone asks the question, you know, why does bad things happen? But that's really not a proper theological question. proper theological question is, why does anything good happen at all? When you think about our sins against God, our sins against each other, our sins against nature, our sins against the world, the question is, why is grass green? Why does God allow us to have beautiful green grass or blue skies or marriage or dance or joy or festivity? Why? We're guilty. And all that demonstrates the mercy of God. And not only does it demonstrate the mercy of God, the goodness, the rain and the sunshine and everything that falls upon this wicked world, you know, is the result of a promise God made in the time of Noah. It's called a covenant. In the covenant, Noahic covenant, the covenant with Noah. But it's also called a covenant of preservation. The world was flooded and the whole world was destroyed except for one family that was saved in order to bring through that family the Redeemer. But, but the, even that day after, after the flood subsided, everyone deserved to die. I mean, if you go on and read the story, the world doesn't get any better. The world should be flooded every day. But God said, He put a rainbow in the sky and He said, look, yes, everyone should die every day. <laughs> But I am going to preserve the world. He's going to restrain men from going into headlong evil. And He's going to restrain His wrath. Why? To do a work of redemption in the world. To do a work of salvation. Okay? And here's what I want you to see. God rest- Men can be evil. But God restrains the evil of men. If God were to pull back, and have no restraining influence on this world, we would destroy ourselves in a day. It would be like the worst nightmare Hollywood could ever form. And we would destroy ourselves and there would be no one saved. There'd be no work of redemption. We would literally cannibalize one another. Do you see? So God's grace is restraining evil. God's grace is holding back His wrath in its full force all the while so that God can do a work of salvation in the world. So, when he says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, it really is. And yet not on its full form and not without the love of God calling forth to men to repent 
and believe. Now, he said it's revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Ungodliness, you know, we need to be careful making some distinct definitions between these two. But ungodliness has to do with not wanting God. Not wanting God, and not only not wanting God, but wanting evil. And Jesus said, you know, why do men not come to the light? Because they love their evil. Why are men ungodly? Why do they not want God? Why do they rebel against God? Because they love their sin. That's why. They love it. Now, he goes on and says this, it's revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now look at this. This is a very important part. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They hold it down. They, they try to stop it. They go like this. Like this. You know, hear no truth. See no truth. Don't want truth. Don't tell me the truth. Okay? And you can see that on a campus. I mean, I've been in campus situations where almost a riot literally breaks out because someone stands up and tells the truth. And the college students, they don't respond with rational arguments. They, spot, they, they, they start screaming out ad hominem arguments. Attack the speaker. Do this. Do that. We don't want to hear what you're saying. Like if I stood up in front of this whole campus and I said, all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What would be the reaction? No! Get this lunatic out of here. We don't want that here. Hold it down. Suppress it. Yet, I could just, I don't have to go to the Bible. I can go to the newspaper. What is the reason for our evil? I mean, we do things to one another animals don't do to one another. Do you see? Suppress the truth. Suppress the truth. Hold it down. Why? I don't want to hear that I'm wrong. Why? Because I love my sin. And if you tell me I'm wrong, you're intolerant. And then, you can't say that. Why? Because you'll make that person feel bad and they might be suicidal. You can't do anything now. You can't tell anybody the truth because you might offend them. You live in a culture unlike anything I've ever seen in all my life. I mean, you could, you could sit there and debate back and forth, even at the university in my day. I think you're wrong. Why? For this reason, this reason, this reason. I think that what you're teaching is immoral. Well, I think it's not immoral. For this reason, this reason. You could actually do You can't do that now. Man, the Gestapo will come and get you. They'll shut you down in a second if you say anything that comes outside of the lines. Because we don't want to hear the truth. You see, and the truth is we're sinners. I'm not okay. You're not okay. We're just wrong. And, and no one wants to hear it. So it, it, it doesn't say that men don't know the truth. It says they know the truth and they suppress it. And why do they suppress it? Because they love their sin and they don't want anybody talking about it. Don't tell me I'm wrong. I'm having a good time. You see, do you know that Christians were, were persecuted as atheists? Did you know that when Christianity started out? Do you know why? Well, there were thousands of gods in, in Rome. In, in the Roman Empire. Just everybody had all kinds of different gods. I mean, they traded gods like baseball cards. Oh, your god's okay, my god's okay, you got a god, I got a god, we all got gods, everybody's happy, our gods love one another. Which they really didn't. They were gods that were totally and completely different from one another. And so everybody's happy. And then the Christians show up and go... Well, no, your God's false, and your God's false, and your God's false, and your God's false. That's why they were called atheists, because they denied the gods. Did you see that? Someone stands up and says, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. And that's why prior to the, the Christians, they hated the Jews. Because, no, you're worshiping demons. That's what you're doing. That's not a god. 
You see? Now, immediately, that's considered hate, isn't it? We've never seen a culture like this. Never. It's, it's literally astounding. If you disagree with me, you hate me. Try that with your math professor. <laughs> professor, if you dis disagree with my exam and don't give me 100, it's because you hate me. No, maybe it's because you're wrong. <laughs> Listen, when someone tells you, you know, I believe this religion is right and this religion is right and this religion is right. Or I believe this guy's right, this guy's right, and this guy's right. Let me teach you a little bit about logic, okay? They don't teach logic in school anymore. If you have three different religions and they totally and fundamentally disagree with each other, then you will have only two logical possibilities. I don't care. You, you can do your political correctness all day long, but there's only two possibilities. You've got three religions that are fundamentally different on how you get to heaven. Here are the possibilities. One of them is right and the other two are wrong or all three of them are wrong. Do you see that? We need a humble... I mean, that's true. One of them is right and the other two are wrong or all three of them are wrong, but all three of them can't be right because they're saying something fundamentally different. Do you see that? It, it's not rocket science. But today, believe it or not, in the West, that no longer applies. No, they're all three right. Well, no, <laughs> it, it, they can't be. They can all be wrong, but they can't all be right because they say three different things. Absolutely different, contrary, opposed to one another. Do you see that? So now, it says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Now, this text is not saying everybody knows there is a God. This text is saying everybody knows the God. That deep down, there's a fundamental element to being human. So I'm not going to argue with an atheist. I'm not going to be smart aleck, but when he says, I don't believe in God, I say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're telling me the truth. And many times when I've talked to an atheist long enough, he gets so... I hate God. I hate Him. No, you said God was a non-entity. You can't hate a non-entity unless you're out of your mind. And, and it'll usually come to, I hate. And it'll usually come to this, I hate Him because He won't let me do. You see... Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. It is an innate sense. Why do all the cultures in the world? Distorted view? Yes. And yet, what do you have? God. Or some distortion of God. Now, what you'll be taught in the university is that man started out polytheistic and animistic then polytheistic and that is this was kind of a Darwinian thing that his evolution his religion evolved until it became monotheistic there's no evidence of that evolutionists have said that since Darwin but there's no there's no evidence as a matter of fact the evidence is to the contrary that nations started out monotheistic and became all these other things. Okay? Just like the Scriptures say, there is an innate knowledge of God in man. And so I'm not going to spend all my day trying to prove to a man something he already knows. He's just suppressing what he knows to be true. And why does he suppress what he knows to be true? Because he loves the darkness and does not want to come to the light.
Now, I was, I was talking to a Spaniard years ago, and we were in something of a debate, and his favorite, favorite philosopher was Unamuno. He is a, a very, very popular, uh, was a very popular uh, philosopher in Spain. And Unamuno wrote a book called La Vida es un Sueño, Life is a Dream. And um, as I was going back and forth with this, this, this man, very intelligent man from Spain, um, he kept quoting Unamuno. And so I said, you know what, I finally figured you out. I know why you like Unamuno. And he said, why is that? You know, ¿Por qué? I said, because Unamuno says that the most noble, the highest, the most honorable thing you can be is a seeker of the truth. And the man said, por supuesto. Soy buscador de la verdad. Okay, you're a seeker of the truth. But Unamuno goes on to say that the most arrogant, basically stupid thing you could ever say is that you found it. So the most noble thing is to be a seeker of the truth, and the stupidest thing you could ever say is that you found it. You see how convenient that is? I am a seeker of the truth, but I never find it, which is really to my advantage, because if I never find it, I don't have to submit to it. See, the problem is, is when you find truth, you have to deal with it. But if you say you're a seeker of the truth that you can never find, then you have the nobility of being a seeker, but you never have to submit to anything outside of yourself. And that's why men hate the truth. They don't want to submit to it. That's why politicians, you'll hardly find a politician that says they're, they don't believe in God. Because, I mean, you know, God, apple pie, Chevrolet, it all goes together, okay? But notice this. Almost every politician says there's a God, but none of them will affirm that He has spoken in any concrete way so that there's absolute truth. Because that's when you get into trouble, isn't it? When there's absolute truth. And it all comes down to lordship. It all comes down to autonomy. Now, I, was, I was talking to a group of young people. I think it was in Romania. It was many years ago at a university. And as I was talking about things, this one guy really got mad. I mean, he got so mad. And he's like, you're trying to force, you know, these laws on me to suppress me and to take away my freedom. And, and I hate these laws and they're immoral. And I said, okay, just, you know, settle down. You made your point. So which law is it that's suppressing you? Is it the one that says, don't kill your neighbor? Is that the one that's ruining your life? Or is it the one that says, don't take another man's wife? Is that the one you're mad about because you want to take another man's wife? Or is it the one that says, don't lie? And then he goes, well, I just want to go out. You know, we just want to go out and party. You know, we're going to go party tonight. I think it was a Friday night or a Saturday night. And I said, what do you mean by party? You mean like wear hats and blow things and eat cake? What do you mean by party? No, I won't go out and get drunk. I said, what are you going to do? We're going to dance and what else? I mean, you, just, you like to dance? <laughs> well, you know, girls and started snickering. And I said, okay, so let, let me see if I get this straight. You and a bunch of boys with, with no thoughts of love in your heart going to go out and get a little bit wasted and then you're going to go out and hunt another man's daughter so that you can have sex with her and talk about her with no intention whatsoever of commitment just for fun. And it would break that man's heart to know you were doing that to his daughter. So, so yeah, my God says that's wrong. And if, if that suppresses you, well, yeah, you need to be suppressed. Do you see? Do you see how things just, you know, it, it sounds so cool, but when you start breaking it apart, man, it's, it's evil. I'm going to go out and hunt. I have two daughters. You hunt my daughters, I'm going to hunt you back. <laughs> I mean, that's horrible. I mean, look how our society has fallen. I don't, I don't know what movie it was. If my wife makes me watch these Victorian era, you know, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility things. 
And, um, and I remember in one of them, the girl reached for a book and the guy reached for the book at the same time and the guy touched her hand. And, and I mean, she, she got flush. He got all nervous. She looked like she was going to pass out. Her face turned red. Isn't that beautiful? Haven't we lost so much that that would mean so much? And yet to us today, it's nothing. It'd be silly. Don't, don't you see? We've kind of just... We've killed poetry. We've taken a knife and jammed it right through the heart of love. There's nothing precious, sacred, beautiful, intimate, like animals. Sometimes when I talk this way, people will go, wow, you know, that's, that's right. We've lost so much. You see, that's why we don't want God. Because God says, no, no, I love beauty. I love love. I love beautiful things. I love people to be noble and kind and compassionate and not boys going out and hunting somebody's daughter. Yeah, that's what will happen on this campus this week in certain places. You know, the Bible is really, you start looking at it, it's, it's really true. So he says, now verse 20, For since the creation of the world, His, that's God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Now, now I want you to look at this because people really misunderstand this passage. He says that you can look at creation and just, just an observation of creation. So first of all, there's this innate knowledge that you know God exists, that He is. But then, when you look at creation, you look outward, there's this second affirmation. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they're without excuse. It's, it's clearly seen. I mean, there's just no way. I'm sorry. Punctuated equilibrium. Irreducible complexity. For an eye to actually get even close to being an eye, there are thousands of parts that all have to come together at one time to work. They don't gradually figure it out over millions of years. Oh, I need this part now. I need this part now. And I mean, you just look at creation and you know there has to be a designer. You know, why do men believe a lie? Why are they so given to not only believing this lie, but producing this lie and carrying this lie on and defending it with such force? Why? Well, first of all, no. It's mainly in pop science that this is done. Not in real science. Secondly, the reason why they do it is because, man, if you can remove God, it's over. Now, it's not... Let's remove God so that we can all love one another tenderly and treat the human body as sacred and precious. And No, it's let's remove God so that we can murder millions of babies a year because they, they inconvenience us. Let's, let's remove God so that we can have sex like animals. Let's remove God so that... Do you see? I mean, just look at it. It's not let's remove God because we want to be more tender, more loving than what the Bible explains. No. no. It's, it's just the opposite. We want to remove God. Now, when, when the argument of design comes up, that when you look at the world and see, it had to be caused. There had to be intelligent design 
someone had to make the world and that someone is God, then someone smart aleckly will say, well, then who made God? Because if you're saying the world couldn't make itself, then and there's a God who made it, then someone had to make God according to your argument. No, that's not true. That's not the argument. And, what is, and it's not Paul's argument. Listen to what Paul's saying. He's saying, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. God is clearly seen in this, in this design, in the intricacies, in everything that is required for us to exist on this planet. God is clearly seen. There has to be a God who made it. Well, then who made God? That's not Paul's argument. You see, when I look at this world, do I see in this world a mind? In, uh, does this world itself, this creation itself, have some sort of eternal attribute? Do I see in this world? Do I see some eternal mind that's able to design? No, I don't. I, I don't see that anywhere. I see a design... But I don't see a design that's able to design itself. I don't see a world that's able to just make itself come into being. So Paul's argument is when you look at the world, you realize there has to be a creator. And there has to be a creator out there that when you look at him, you realize he needs no creator. That he is because he is. He has to be there. And when you look at this world, you realize it's not here because it's here. It's not, it's not is because it is. Something had to make it. And that cause is uncaused out there. There has to be something out there that is. But when I look around here, I see that this is not it. There's something outside of this system. Someone outside of this system. Intelligent making design. And so, you know there's a God innately. You look around you, there's a God. And so, he goes on, verse 21, "...for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools." And now look at this. And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. When you look at cultures, when you look at societies, now this is very, very important. Let's go to Rome. Let's go to Greece. What did they worship? corruptible man. The gods were basically in the form of men. Do you realize that? The statues of the gods, men. The, the goddesses, women. I've seen some of them in Ephesus and different places where I've been. And so, you see gods that are men. But you go into other cultures that seem to be a bit more primitive and what do you start seeing? Birds, four-footed animals, crawling creatures. Egyptians worship beetles. So what he's talking about is as men profess to be wise, rejected God because of their evil. They did not want Him. They were given over to where they're worshiping themselves, then they're worshiping a cow. Then they're worshiping a snake or a lizard. They're worshiping a bug. You see that, don't you, in cultures everywhere? Now, let's take the, the view that, you know, all gods are the same. Okay? So, you know, a man in the rainforest lifts up a frog. A frog. Or an Egyptian a few thousand years ago lifts up a 
beetle and says, Behold my God. Now let's compare that to the God of Scripture. Now a real frog, mind you, okay? The God of Scripture, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, moral, holiness, justice, wisdom, creates a world, sustains a world. So that's this God, and then the other God is a beetle. Tell me how those are the same things. I mean, just come on, you know, get your head out of the, the false academic bubble it's in and just come on. Somebody stop talking and just listen at what everybody else is saying and you're going, you've got to be kidding me. This is the same? It's not the same. Why would someone prefer a beetle over a moral God? Because we don't want morality. Do you see that? We don't want it. The beetle doesn't tell me what to do. Why would we reject a good God? There's only one reason. We're not good. Why would we reject a God that says don't lie? Because we lie. Why would we reject a God that says don't take your neighbor's wife? Because if the neighbor's wife is beautiful enough, we'd like to take her. Do you see? It's not because men do not know God. They know Him. At least they know enough about Him to hate Him and to reject Him. And in verse 24, and this is as far as we're going to get, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impunity, impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then in 26, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. And then He gives a list of degrading passions. Not only sexual degrading passions, but also all sorts of immoralities. Everything that we see. Now, here, here's one of the things I want you to see. If you don't know history, you are destined to repeat it. We see this all the time. With the removal of God from society, society does not become more noble. It does not become more loving. It does not become more kind. It becomes twisted. Twisted. I mean, I mean, look at us. We will put a man in jail for killing a puppy. And I have no problem with that. I like puppies. I have a puppy at my house right now. But another man can be involved in the slaughter of thousands and thousands of babies. Or a political official can say, Abandonment of a child right after it's born is the mother's choice. Do you see that? You can only do these things when there is no God in your world. At least no God of Christianity. And, 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 and this is what you need to see. I remember listening to an interview, I believe it was an FBI agent, around the year 2000. And he said, uh, the 90s were kind of known as there was an increase in violence and things like that. And they asked him, they said, so what about the future? He said, we'll look back on the 90s and call it the golden era of peace and tranquility, the way the world is headed. And, and it's true. It, it's true. And I was reading an article. I, I never had the chance to to check out everything on it, but it said when the teachers, national teachers, something or other got together in like the 50s, the number one problem in high schools was gum chewing.
You see, what the Bible says about man is true. And, and you will see, as a society gets farther and farther away from God, you will see the depreciation of humanity. The death of children is not a new thing. The offering of children to Moloch was all throughout the Old Testament. The offering of the fruit of your womb to burn them before a God. The, the eventual, well, old people shouldn't really receive that much medical attention because they're taking it away from those who really need it and who will live. You will see hearts grow cold. We're already seeing it. We hear, even hear politicians talking this way. You see? Questionnaires handed out in universities that say something like this, in a utilitarian society, young people, which group of people would you kill first? So, know that one of the so many reasons that I believe in the Scriptures is because the only, it's the only writings that address what's going on and that explain our behavior. That explain it, you see. But God did something to redeem humanity. He sent His Son. He sent His Son. He died in the place of the guilty. He satisfied the demands of God's justice. And we can come back to God reconciled as children, not through a church, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what it's about. All right, well, let's pray. Father, thank You. Thank You for Your kindness, Your mercy, and I pray that You would bless these students with an ever-increasing knowledge and love for You. In Jesus' name, Amen.